Burke, the author behind Living Without Fear and the co-publisher of the Amazon best-selling Inspired Journeys. If you are ready to embark on a journey of boundless possibilities, I'm here for you. Do you know someone who could benefit from today's episode? Share this podcast with them. Don't forget to subscribe to my newsletter, join me on YouTube, and if you enjoyed what you heard, leave a short review or rate it on your favorite podcast platform with a lot of stars. Your support means the world to me and I'm truly grateful for each and every one of you. Thank you. And today I'm so happy to have Catherine Rapesom with me. She's a seasoned communication professional with 20 plus years of experience, champions the art of embodied communication. Rooted in the belief that feelings need a language, she guides individuals to reconnect with their body for authentic communication. Having worked globally in Paris, Berlin, Geneva, London and Zurich, Catherine excelled in communication roles for renowned brands like Covin, Klein, Peugeot and Swiss Films. Transitioning to coaching, she integrates practices like circling and surrendered leadership, emphasizing embodiment work in communication. As a systemic business coach, Catherine encourages clients to explore authentic connections and purposeful communication, bridging the corporate world with embodied presence. Welcome to the show, dear Catherine. Thank you, Esther, for this lovely introduction. So let's start with my favorite question. What has been your turning moment in life? Hmm. It's it's interesting because sitting here just now, I wonder if one day I'll look back at this moment as a turning moment in life. Um, it's my first podcast uh, interview, so thank you. But there is actually one moment which was a deeply um, turning moment in my life. It was as a teenager. I guessed, I felt in my body that something was off, that something was wrong, and um, found out that my dad wasn't actually my biological father. And that got lots of things rolling. Hmm. And did you meet your biological father later, or is it... I, I did, but it's not so important really what happened out of that um, because it's what fascinates me now after all these years, it's more how many traces all the things which happened to us in our life are left in our bodies. And it's um, if it's unpleasant things, it's like ticking time bombs. And if it's pleasant things, it gives us so much strength and power. And it's uncovering all the the, the mystery in ourselves, which has um, become more and more a passion. And how is it today for you to, to have a biological father and another father? Well, the dad I grew up, um, unfortunately, passed away. With the mm -hmm. other, there's no contact anymore for reasons. And um, it's just part of my identity. And um, it's easier now with a, in my 50s, looking back, how all the challenges of life are also gifts. And um, in preparing for our podcast uh, meeting today, I suddenly thought, there are like topics for each decade and um yeah this it's it's funny how life goes but um things which seem unpleasant in the moment which challenge us which also create triggers which pop up later in life 
also such magical gifts. And I think many people can can relate to this. And uh, yeah, it led me really to the body. Um, from from food in my teens, one big topic was eating disorders, and it's funny. It led me then to the first uh, professional uh, wishes I had, which was fashion design, because there was a discomfort in my body, and then noticing how, depending on what I was wearing, the the fabrics, the cuts, the colors how it enhanced the way I felt good or bad. And um, and and today when I when I think of how I approached fashion at the time, it was also all about feelings. I actually wanted people to feel good in their clothes, to feel good uh, in their body. That was what I was trying to um, explore and create by designing clothes. Mm -hmm. And today, what? How do you consider fashion, or what's the role of clothes today for you? I I still love fashion. I love the creativity. I love the fabrics. I love quality. Um, of course, I got to know also the most exquisite fashion. I was at the best fashion school in Paris, Studio Berceau, and it's really the mecca of creatives. I got to work with amazing photographers as a fashion stylist for magazines, which led me then later on to writing about fashion. And even if I didn't um, practice much the profession of fashion designer, a little bit a fashion stylist, and later with communication studies, I became a fashion and beauty journalist. It's still always been there. It's like a filter to look at life, to see how society is expressed. And also it's an interesting way to see what people show or, or hide or protect or are open with in their selves. Mm. And, and you, sorry, no, it's okay. And and you said, yeah, you in your puberty or later, you were dealing with feelings and eating disorder because maybe you wanted to stuff down some feelings, unpleasant feelings. And now today, it's different, I guess. Well, actually, the eating disorders were also for me like a, a way to discover my body, actually, because in the 80s, it was a lot about dieting. There there were it was a whole completely discourse and vocabulary than there is today around food. But for me, a turning point was when I discovered traditional Chinese medicine and suddenly it wasn't about counting calories and points anymore, but it was also there getting a feeling, a feeling of who I am, where am I living, what are the seasons, what is the region where I'm from. And it completely changed my approach to my body, really recognizing how what I put in uh, changes the feeling, the physical feelings and the emotional ones. And it's it's been with me since it never left. And um, I never trained to become a nutritionist, but I've accompanied uh, quite a few people on their path with food and eating disorders. And later when I discovered presence work, it was actually the first program that I created. I noticed at a certain point that I've created lots of um, programs out of experiences with with uh, clients and their desires and their fears and it somehow traces the path I've been on of becoming present becoming present with food becoming present with the body and clothes and then movement and um, yeah I it was uh, Embrace Your Inner Elephant was the name I came up with <laughs> because uh, discovering then later on personal development, there was a lot of people talk about the inner child and then you have nuances, the inner teenager perhaps and all these different aspects. 
And speaking to a friend, we've realized that we both had this picture of an elephant feeling like an elephant. <laughs> and suddenly when, when I discovered presence work with the practice of circling, I thought, wow, I think I have an inner elephant. So what, it, what if it's all about embracing our inner elephant? And uh, that's what gave the title to this program. Mm -hmm. And I, I really love, um, yeah, accompanying humans to be more present uh, with their body, their relationship to food, to not count calories. And it's funny, it doesn't, uh, I realize it doesn't really matter which program or which topic it is. There's, there's something which always comes back. It's connecting to the body, connecting to its sensations, allowing myself and the others to feel the feelings. And then what, what also became my profession later, communication, because it's also about learning to put words on it. We can feel a lot. We can think a lot. But you addressed the topic of fear and there's so much fear in actually voicing out what we have inside. And it's like, a, ah, ah. And then when it comes out, there's, there's a relief. There's a relief in the person. And if we meet and connect in a circle, there's always this moment where the circle breathes also because there's such a relief. And um, it's... Um, I was speaking before about the memory in our cells. It's it's these all these memories which are in our bodies. They're with us all the time, and in each human connection, we we take it along. And there's this fragile moment when we start exploring this deeper, where if I'm really honest enough to to feel it all and to express it and listen to what the other people then answer, we realize that they noticed it all along, even if we were pretending to hide it. And so my work today, there where I was wishing to help through a fancy fashion outfit before through the outside, my ambition today is that by becoming much more connected to our inside, to our feelings, and being really aware of this, there's a different strength. There's a, a quality of standing in our life, of speaking our truth, um, which, which brings us into a quality of leadership, which isn't taught in the books. It, it comes with the experience, with the daring to, to go into um, a quality of awareness of ourself. Um, I love the <laughs> the elephant in <laughs> ourselves. Uh, can we come back to that? D do you still think, Catherine, that there is an elephant in you, or did it become something smaller, or what happened all these e along all these years? Oh, I made peace with my inner elephant. <laughs> um when was it in my early 40s that was probably an, another essential turning point it was giving birth to my daughter with 39 and a half and um yeah it was all these things which got broken in me around the lies of who i am where i come from and people who are most important are parents when they lie to us, it does something. And um, I'd worked quite a bit on that already then. But diving deeply into my most uh, instinctive body uh, awareness, that really came up with um, pregnancy. And I gained quite a bit of weight during pregnancy. But afterwards... I don't know what it was. It just it, my body was ready, my my soul was ready to let go. I used to speak of this airbag. Uh, it felt like an, a protective airbag, and I I never felt like this bigger body was truly me. 
Um, and suddenly it was it was time to let go, and it really happened quite naturally. Um, I had this awareness already of uh, eating with the seasons and regional, seasonal, and all of that. And I used um, metabolic balance to find like like a structure. Uh, structure is a topic which comes up quite often also uh, in my life, I noticed. And falling in love with structure and when it comes to food, it's been over 10 years now. My daughter's 15, so I think it was when she was around three that I did metabolic balance for a couple of months. And I come back to it on and off to, for me, it's like a, a cleansing a body cleansing to do that once or twice a year and uh, just get back into the um, a, a pureness. And I don't need this protection outside anymore. I have it from the inside nowadays. Mm. And there's a lot of tenderness for this younger me who didn't have the awareness, didn't have the strength, uh, who needed this outer protection. And fashion is also a bit that. So on the outer level, it's less important of being in fashion nowadays for me. It's more about being true in the clothes that I choose. And uh, I love materials. I, I, I love cashmere and silk. It's just such a pleasure on the skin. That's more what's important mm -hmm. today. But it becomes a, a timeless quality. It doesn't have this fashion trend element anymore mm. and now you work with people and their feelings and their elephants probably and when you see someone with a this elephant inside how do you approach the conversation mm. i i i don't address topics around food and and um Things like uh, like body weight, I wouldn't address it from me. Um, if it becomes a subject in the conversation, then yes. But it's more about presence work in a general. The embracing your inner elephant is only one part of it. And it's more, yeah, the, the quality of presence and um, it's just... People ask, why should I be present? Why should I even learn to be present? Or what, is, what does it bring me? And for me, it's really a, a way of leading ourself. It's this self-empowerment. And I was um, musing about it the other day because people speak a lot about being authentic, just be yourself. And I thought, but people don't even know so much who they are. There are so many influences. Your mother also. So accompanying my daughter, who's now in her teenage years, and it's what what school does she want to go to? Does she want to learn a profession? Which one? There's there's so much pressure. And then we have our families. We have... Uh, all the people and systems we're confronted to have an influence on us and we lose ourselves. So learning to be present again is connecting to this inner part, which is our essence, this purest uh, part inside of us. And one of my clients once said, Katrine, people come to you once they've tried everything. And then they're ready for their essence. And the the clients I work with have changed. When I, when I started with my coaching, I thought I would coach self-employed people, solopreneurs in their communication questions. And from day one, it, it became, they, they would come because of their website, because of social media strategy. But it was never about that. It was about them as a human being. And it's one of the reasons why um, 
I know that's not so important just here, but um, yeah, so starting off on a business track brought me right away into personal development much stronger than I thought it would ever be. And so food is one of the topics, but there's all kinds of aspects in which we lead or don't lead ourselves. Love is a huge topic, loving ourselves. And for me, presence is this magical ingredients to which enhances everything because it um, makes the quality of how we perceive life itself, the things we do, the situations we're in, it makes the awareness a lot bigger. And um, that's what it's about. I love it, what you said, um, loving ourselves. Yeah, it's a um, task, never ending, lifelong thing, I, I guess, or I feel it like that. How do you help people to to love themselves? What what are maybe the first exercises you do, or how do you approach them? Hmm. Actually, th this topic is often interests people because um, I actually married myself. I don't know if I told you about this. But I married myself um, almost four years ago now. It was in May 2020 in the middle of COVID. And I had a couple of years before I had this picture. I'm going to get married with 50. It just felt like a good thing. I was sitting on the beach in France and I had this clear image. I'm getting married with 50. And then the certain situation in March 2020 made me realize, what was I thinking of? I can't get married to anyone else. I have to marry myself first. And I didn't know at that time that uh, there's this wave of people getting married. And I, one of the pop stars, I think Taylor Swift or somebody like this, we call it solo gami. There's a word for it now. And lots of also more spiritual practices. For me, it was a real act of intimacy it was saying yes to myself and I really went I wanted to do it in a wedding chapel in the um, canton of um, how do you say it in English Grison, Graubünden. but it was closed because of COVID so I ended up getting married to myself in nature I had a friend who did the ceremony and mm -hmm. my daughter and her daughter were maids of honor and it was really like I had imagined my marriage would be a long white dress, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. And we looked quite funny, me in this white dress in the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a point of no return in this ceremony. Um, my daughter and I got in a, a quite a friction and I was ready to blow it off. And I thought, Katrine, what are you doing? Uh, it's for the good and the bad. And I, I think you say it like that in, in English, in guten und in schlechten Zeiten, in German. And it changed everything. Even now when I just speak about it with you, I, I feel how my heart becomes... Uh, warm and vibrating and um yeah there, there there was no turning back after this but i just had an idea pop through my mind i wanted to tell you <sighs> maybe let's come back to how you help other people to love themselves um maybe can you share your most important lessons about that if you can make it to three yes it would be nice it's really about getting to know themselves it's what i was saying before people speak a lot about presence but they don't know how to be present so i invite people to slow down first of all so that they can feel 
and uh, that's what I was wanting to tell you. Being present is not always pleasant. I offer presence circles and they're not always a happy presence circle because when we're present with all that is, it means really all that is. So you asked me for three things to observe. It's it's really quite simple and yet complex. It's staying on the level of the bodily sensations, then feeling really into your feelings and owning them, also trusting them. And then it's voicing them out. That's where, for me, is the link to communication, which is why it's become such an essential work of my communication coaching, because presence is, is really the most important ingredient. And learning to speak of this. And the more I know my body, I know to feel my feelings, I, I know when it's off, I know when I'm not telling the truth. And it's not about not telling lies. It's about not telling myself lies. It's about respecting myself. And that's loving myself. Being present with myself is the biggest act of love. Yes, indeed. And just another question. What helps you the most in doing this, in following this? idea it's not an idea when when we use words it sounds like an idea but for me an idea is in the head and over time even though words still come out so that i can exchange myself with you it's really a language which comes out of my body and that's what has changed everything and so I'll do all kinds of things to be in my body, from yoga practice, going out in nature, dancing. That's why for me, the presence practice is not to be seen as a tool, like with, with a clear, um, you have to stick to these rules. It's more like uh, you add it on to all the other things you're doing anyway. And it takes time. It really takes time. Thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing your thoughts and your ideas. Thank you, Esther. And thank you so much, dear listener, for spending your precious time with us today. And in case you feel worthless and nobody seems to like you, we tell you, you're amazing. We love you. And you are a gift to everyone who crosses your path. And please tell yourself these sentences over and over again. Have an amazing day and talk to you next